Broadcasting live. It's America's longest-running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. I hope all of you are having a great Friday and you are doing something fun or just wrapping up work. And hey, you know, we can do something to uh, you know help you get through your work day. And I'm also hoping that all of you are paying attention to, uh, you know, I, I know that I am uh, quite, quite, uh, you know, keeping a close eye on, of course, BlizzCon huge fan of blizzard and everything that they do and you know, a lot of announcements unfortunately computer and technology news will not be covering that later on in the program but instead we are going to you know just be, be doing uh general technology news and we'll save all that for a blizzcon roundup probably next tuesday so tune in for that now for that being said, welcome into the program. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and we have a great show planned for you today. As joining us, we have, of course, Spatialand. And you may not have heard about them before, but I guarantee you their work and what they're working on is going to be, you know, affecting your lives here really, really soon. So, with, uh, with that said, before we get started, a few things to mention, including ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find anything and everything having to do with today's show. Be it a link to our guest website, any articles that we do, videos, uh, you know, things like that. You can find it in the show notes after the, after the program. Also, be sure to check out the live video feed where you can watch Computer America and not just listen. And the last thing is, of course, our contest, which we will be giving away a prize to a lucky listener here uh, you know, later on in the program. And that's sponsored by Logitech. So, in the meantime, uh, why don't we just jump right into this and uh, bring him on the program. So, again, Spatial Land, uh, you know, we're going to hear all about them, what they do, and how they do it. Because, hey, virtual reality, it's, uh, you know, it's definitely an up-and-coming technology. And applications for it, we are, to put it mildly, I feel like we're still discovering just what is best for this technology. So, hopefully, to clear some of this up is going to be Mr. David Lee, and he is the CSO and COO for Spatial Land. And so, welcome onto the program, David. Uh, thank you, Craig, and uh, uh, very, very honored to be on the program. Yeah, this is going to be great. And uh, yeah, so why don't we just go ahead and uh, again, you know, uh, no offense, but Spatial Land, first time I'm hearing about this. Why don't you give, uh, you know, myself and our audience a bit of a background and then a bit of background on yourself. How did you find yourself working for uh, Spatial Land? Yeah, no, um, you know, um, we've, we've kept a pretty low profile, um, but we are, uh, Spatial Land is a VR uh, production studio and a technology developer based in Venice, California. Um, uh, a little bit of the history of um, the company, it was founded by Kyle and Kimberly Cooper, both come from the visual effects and motion title sequencing film uh, space, Kyle being kind of a godfather of motion titles and um, prologue films has created, um, you know, Jarvis that Tony Sparks plays with in, 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 uh, in Iron Man 2 mm -hmm. and Minority Report. So a lot of strong visual effects. Um, so we've got that entire creative uh, team on the studio side. And on the development side, um, or as far as our technology and platform that we provide, is, is a, it's really more of this intuitive platform that empowers brands, companies, artists, and storytellers to create virtuality destinations. I like to sometimes use the analog that we are the, the, the WordPress for VR, helping, you know, it's really hard to create VR content right now. So... For, for us to give people uh, kind of a head start in, in creating their VR experience is, is kind of the impetus and the goal of the platform that we developed as well. Yeah, no, and, and like I said, this is a new field for a lot of people, but 
it's one that's been, you know, uh, I think hyped up to a certain point a couple years ago. Obviously, the first time people saw VR was, um, or at least, you know, uh, decent VR was, uh, you know, with Oculus Rift and uh, the HT, uh, is it the Vive? Yeah, the Vive. I mean, things like this, yep. they've, they've been promised that, you know, there's going to be amazing content. It's going to be a whole new experience, uh, so on and so forth. Why don't you, uh, you know, kind of give us, uh, you know, kind of an outline about why people should be excited about VR because I don't think it's hit that tipping point of VR is, you know, the next evolution or even just, you know, kind of evolving alongside traditional media. It, it just hasn't tipped yet. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think when it comes to a new um, industry like VR, it, it, it's always going to follow that typical hype cycle. And right now we're in a little bit of we're still in that disillusionment phase because I think generally there are there's a lot of buzz, um, but there's still a lot of this, you know, negative sentiment around. I get nauseous when I'm in a you know a headset, and you know these headsets are big and kludgy. And um, I think that right now the VR industry is kind of waiting for that killer app to really come along and and help get that consumer adoption. Um, I think we've got roughly, I think the last numbers I've heard is 16 million headsets. So consumer adoption is still re relatively low. Uh, the price points make, make it, make it harder for people to kind of go out and buy a, a headset. I think the Rift is about $500 right now with the Vive being more expensive than that. So it's still, right. it's still uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty penny for, for that technology, especially when, a lot of that content that you're seeing is is really, you know, you got games, which is an easy transition, um, and then you've got entertainment that's pushing out 360 video. I think the real excitement is going to come when um, there's that killer app. So I I think you're seeing a lot of enterprises uh, starting to adopt VR, and you know they've got innovation and emerging technology teams that are investing heavily in VR to see how that is going to impact their business and what that means for them. Um, on the consumer side, I think there's some interesting stuff happening with music that we're working with. Um, and I think the, the, the real big key area where I think you're going to see a lot of adoption is a kind of a bet that, that I'm making is that it's going to be on the social side. I think that, you know, a dating app within VR or, or something that just gets a lot of buzzes is going to really help kind of fuel that adoption in the next year or two. You know, and, and I've, I've seen a couple examples of that. I think that VR needs their own version of Pokemon Go because we've had AR, you know, AR <laughs> uh, companies on the program and their job was so difficult to convince people that AR was a good idea or even what is AR. And then after Pokemon Go went out, they just simply said, well, it's kind of like Pokemon Go. Like, VR needs a similar kind of experience that everyone just kind of gravitates to and that they can experience on their own. Um, dating and social, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, I've seen, you know, and it's not even so much that you have to put yourself and your face in a virtual environment and, you know, you have to look just like a person. I've seen applications that have uh, virtual avatars of people. And I'll be honest, you know, seeing people interact like that, even that was the most social, you know, social I've seen people be, you know, because it's not you, but it's, a, it's someone representing a person. People act so much differently when they when they're in VR compared to any other medium I found. It, and, and obviously, you guys work with VR. Uh, do you feel that's one of the you know big selling points of virtual reality is the fact that it's so social and you like you just get experiences you can't really get yeah. looking at a monitor. I think you're spot on, Craig. I think that. The difference in VR is, is you know, when we see first-time, you know, users put on a headset, um, they're excited because they're, they're excited about VR. They're excited about, well, what is it, number one? And when they get to have that, six, what we call six degrees of freedom, right, they can move up, down, left, right, back, and forward, and all the sensor tracking follows them so they can see that movement inside this virtual world as they're actually in that space. Um, the other really interesting thing that, that I was able to pick up on, on during a couple focus groups is that 
people love using their hands. Mm -hmm. They love, you know, playing with a controller and actually, you know, seeing their hands actually do something. It's very different than when, you know, people first got on the web and desktop and they were interacting, but it was really just a mouse and a keyboard. Um, Mobile came along and really gave everybody that, you know, the ease and convenience of having something right in your pocket, kind of like a digital wallet and easy access to everything in their life. Uh, VR is just really just more immersive. And I think the, the one really key selling point and, and, you know, I think that us being, you know, right down the street from Hollywood is that for VR, for content creators to get VR right, um, it's, it's really about storytelling. I think the analog could be played back to mobile. When, when mobile first came out, everybody needed to have a mobile app. But a lot of the mobile apps were basically just a shrink-down version of their website. Yeah. And, and companies finally learned that mobile has a different use case. They have different experiences. So they've adopted to creating you know, native iOS or Android apps. Um, VR is going to go through that same cycle where you're going to see some bad content until you see something that's just truly immersive and that really starts with storytelling. And I think that blend of technology folks um, and, and the storytellers and the creative directors, um, you know, based out of the film industry is really going to, um, that, that convergence is really, really exciting. And, and I think, I think you had asked earlier, like, why did I get into VR? And I think, my background is the game industry, and and um, I think that what I'm seeing happening in VR and and all the little companies that are popping up all around kind of the Silicon Beach area here and in, 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 in LA is that you're you're getting this creative, immense creative talent working with you know technologists and engineers to create something that's pretty new. It's there's going to be some bad apps out there, but yeah. I, I you know there's going to be when one takes off, it's really just going to, you know, I think kind of explode. And I think that's going to happen, you know, in the next like 12 to 18 months. Yeah. It, it, I mean, there, there's definitely room for another Minecraft, you know, a, a game that I think a lot of people said was, you know, kind of reached its peak and then Microsoft purchased it. And Hey, you know, now it's, uh, you know, the most downloaded game, like a year or two running. It's, uh, you know, there's definitely room for new people to come into the space and that kind of brings me to my question. Obviously, you know, we're talking about VR in general. Why don't we get to, you know, kind of spatial land? Where do you fit in? Where do you fit in with all this? Because, you know, you could be content creators. You could, you know, uh, build better sensors. There's a lot of space for improvement in virtual reality. What does spatial land do? Yeah. So we've got this. I consider ourselves really. Um, you know, storytellers, storytellers and technologists. Um, really, the, the the ethos of the company is creative. Um, you know, creative artists. And but what we're doing in VR that's different than everybody else is we're not just a solo studio that that has original IP that we're developing. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not just uh, taking you know work for hire as a studio, but instead what we're doing is we're creating a platform that really has, you know, we really map to the, the, the kind of the growth cycle of VR. So what we're providing right now is we're trying to make, we're trying to ease the pain points of creators and especially businesses, people who want to create VR experiences to prototype what they can do in, in taking their retail stores or in e-commerce. What does it mean for, um, you know, folks in travel and hospitality um, and real estate. And I can, I can kind of dive into use cases for those, but sure. really, you know, the company is designed around creating this tool set and product suite that allows content creators to easily log in, jump in, get into a headset, uh, choose what industries they're in, be able to pull all of these different templates and assets that they can use to cr- start creating a, um, uh, like if I am a, a landlord or a property management company, I can pull in my CAD assets of my building and start dressing it up with furniture that people can actually, you know, you know, 
future tenants can come in and actually see what that would look like, walk around the entire you know building and space, change the furniture from a startup mode to more traditional legal office, and really give them a sense of, wow, what's the value for, for these landlords is that you don't have a broker going around taking a CEO to 10 different spaces when, you know, that CEO is pretty busy. So that that's really on the content creation side. We've also got, you know, once people are building content, the next real, the next big thing everybody's going to want is, okay, so what are my users doing inside of VR? Mm-hmm. Like, where are they looking? What are they interacting with? So there's a big, um, you know, we have analytics and engagement. Um, that's, that's, we think are going to be really the audience for that is marketers and product owners who, who got good content, but now they need to know how to retain their users and understand what they're doing. Um, and then last piece is just that, you know, VR is a new medium, um, just like mobile. So when the, when the market grows and kind of gets to a mature perspective, you're going to see advertisers get into the space you're going to see other technology companies wanting to integrate to vr or vr publishers integrating to all these different systems so we've got a core integration layer that integrates into all these widely used technologies that that people have been using for ages and um you know we want to make it easy for them to plug in vr into their existing organization and business I, I'm part of this, uh, you know, I'd say about three, four, five years ago, there was a slew of uh, companies that started up, you know, uh, I can name a couple off the top of my head, such as uh, Wix, One in One. I'm sure there are other, uh, you know, kind of website builders and, you know, mobile app, uh, you know, kind of uh, services that say that you could do it yourself, you could design it yourself, and you'd be up and running in no time compared to more traditional means. Do you want to be that for virtual reality? Do you want to be, you know, kind of the company that people come to and, you know, it's not going to be as, uh, you know, as fully fleshed out and customized and personalized as, you know, going to a studio, starting up, hiring 100 people and, you know, really devoting some real resources to it. Do you just want to be, you know, kind of like people's entry point into just creating their own VR content? Yeah, I think you're spot on. Um you know, I've, I've always used the analog as WordPress, but I, Wix, I'll take that. Um, I think for, for right now, um, being in VR, the more content that's out there, the better the industry, it's the, the better it will be for the industry. So our, our, you know, charitable gift to the industry is helping people just create content. And that could be from enterprising wanting to rapidly prototype what their VR experience could be to other people who actually just – want to create more of a, you know, a Netflix type, you know, portfolio of different categories of 360 videos and other multimedia. Um, so we want to be the, the Wix, the WordPresses for VR, but I think our end game is that we really want to be the, the Adobe for, for VR and offering not just helping people create content, but understand it, help them market it, and eventually, you know, really go down to helping their end consumers with with their product or services hopefully with a few less security flaws than adobe finds themselves with um, you know, <laughs> here and there but and and so let's uh you know let's talk about some of the industries because you know here on the show of course we've been following vr very closely and it seems like you know uh, we have one uh, one contributor to the show she focuses on you know kind of kind of the elderly and you know what what technology should uh, you know, people over 50, 55, what should they be focusing on? Um, you know, things like self-driving cars and yada, yada. VR has come up a lot. And you mentioned it recently with uh, things like traveling and, uh, you know, sightseeing. Maybe someone is less mobile or, you know, they, they find it impossible to, to uh, you know, kind of vacation. What industry, and, and, you know, if you could talk about, you know, kind of the, uh, the sightseeing tourism uh, industry with VR and other industries that you feel VR is going to rapidly start changing. Yeah, so I, I, I think, um, well, well, let's start with games. I think it's such an easy transition because for people that play games and in, you're already in this really immersive world, um, VR actually puts you right at the center of that world where you could turn around 
you know, and move around, you know, outside of using your keyboard and your mouse. Um, so that, 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 that transition is, is, I think makes sense for a lot of people, but, you know, we talked about social a little bit. Um, we haven't really seen anything really get out there. That's, that's big, but I think that, you know, dating would be pretty interesting. Um, when it comes to travel and hospitality, the way I see it is, you know, I, I often find myself, you know, traveling to the same destinations or, mm -hmm you know, all inclusive resorts. And, and it's really hard to, you know, when you're planning a vacation for your family to, to, you know, to spend thousands of dollars to go on a nice vacation, um, but, you know, to, to places you've never been to where you don't know what, you know, what the, the, the vicinity to, to different places, um, you know, you find, you know, static websites that can help you, but it, it's sometimes hard to, to, to make that call. So I, I find myself going to the, the places that I know where I know I had a good time, but I, you know, my wife will say, Hey, let's go to Italy. And I'm like, yeah, well, where do you want to go? And have you been there? No. Well, you know, let's, let's, I think having, you know, travel hospitality, I think will be, VR will be a big hit because it allows somebody to actually go and check out the amenities, not in a 360 video or a flat, you know, photo, but, I can actually just walk through my room, walk through the spaces of the amenities. I can, you know, teleport to what the theater looks like, what the gym looks like, what's actually in there. So it, it really puts people in a, that, 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 that place like right there and then it's photo real and everything looks real. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they could sit on the beach and see what the water's like and the amenities. I think that would help me more. And also I think capturing, you know, if I'm, if I'm, you know, going to Italy and I want to see, um, for sightseeing to actually see what the Coliseum would actually look like and feel like would be more impressive and have me more kind of motivated to want to, to, you know, to, to, to book that travel. Um, and, and, you know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it, you know, using VR, it's not just capturing, you know, life as you see it, but you know, uh, your Coliseum example just kind of sprung to my mind. If, if a person could have a button or some way to kind of say, now recreate the Coliseum as it was, you know, mm -hmm. when it was in use, you know, you could, uh, you know, not just give people experiences, but in some cases, give them more in-depth and informative experiences than just actually being there. Yeah, I, I think um, we've just got to, you know, unfortunately, I can't disclose the, the company's name, but we just got it uh, done. Or, and we're still actively working with, you know, one of the you know, largest retailers and, what we're doing for them isn't really just taking, you know, creating, recreating a store and allowing users to, to push a card and pick up products and look at them mm -hmm. and put it in their, you know, cart and check out. It was really different. It, what we did was we took products that are well-known products that people have heard of and we try to build that brand affinity and, and create, you know, the history of this product, how it was made, who were the founders. So we would, you know, create photo collages and different rooms where you can explore different products. Um, you could take, um, you know, like, you know, very authentic watches or, you know, um, expensive high quality watches and, and really find out like the minutia and the details and the histories of who were the founders. You know, this was founded in 1870 and kind of go through that. Um, so we took a different approach to, you know, helping a lot of our companies come up with what the experience should be in it. And I think you're right. There's a, there's an educational piece that you can really, really, um, you know, portray that helps users get more, um, they just get more excited about everything when they're learning about things versus just being presented something. How how do you feel about companies? And uh, you know, I, I'm not talking like I'm sure you know uh, you you know your company. I'm sure that more and more large retailers are looking at this because they know uh, online you know online shopping is not going anywhere and being able to you know in some sense look and feel and uh, manipulate an item is still desired but just not possible currently. Um, how, how do you feel about companies such as uh, IKEA? You know, springs to mind where they're actually allowing. Uh, you know, they're doing some augmented reality with uh, their app, but okay. I'm sure they're working in VR. Um, Lowe's is doing the same thing where people will actually kind of recreate your home and paint it, decorate it for you. 
Um, do, you, do you think that these companies are on the right track about, you know, not just having blanket content for their content, but also personalizing it to your room, your house, uh, you know, making it personal? Yeah, I, I love what, what, what IKEA is doing with their AR app. I mean, I would have had loved to have, you know, used that years ago before buying something and returning it. I think there's going to be a heavy use case for AR, and AR is really going to uh, help the, the kind of e-commerce retail space, um, allowing people to kind of put a couch where, they, where it is in their room uh, with their phone. I think VR is going to be more interactive. It's, it, there's going to be that, a bit of the educational piece to it. It's going to be, well, let's paint the room, but you know what? Let's actually help you with what type of paint you want. Um, is it a roller? Is it a spray? Have you ever sprayed a room before? So I think it's going to be helping people kind of go through the process of actually uh, personalizing it and, and educating them. And I think that's, that's going to be the real big difference is that, you're going to get people interacting with things. Um, you know, if you could imagine that, you know, companies who are selling out outdoor products like REI, if, if, you know, people buying tents, tents is something that's really tough to buy. Mm -hmm. um, you you got to learn how to put it together. I, I remember the first time I went camping and I did not learn to never pitch a tent when the sun is going down and it's nighttime and the tent's not up and I still don't know what I'm doing. But, you know, there are, products that sometimes um, are at a price point where you need an in-store experience. You know, customers typically won't buy that online. They, they need to go to the store to see, you know, the size of it, the weight of it, you know, how do I put this together? What's the ease of putting it? You know, it's like kind of like, you know, buying a baby stroller. Um, I think VR is, is really going to help um, get conversion for a lot of these retailers in the sense that people get to, interact with the products just like they're in the store. And I think the, you're going to see more of that in VR than you're going to see, you know, somebody wanting to buy a product that they really don't need to interact with. Um, it's really going to be the ones that, that require in-store experiences um, is where I think that VR is really going to help the retailers. Yeah. So take us, uh, you know, your, and by the way, I'm probably going to have to interrupt you. I, I'm sorry. Would you mind saying over, uh, you know, for a couple minutes so we can finish up the interview. We're about to hit a break. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, perfect. So, but yeah, um, you know, we have about two minutes left so we can get started here. Take us on your idea of where VR lands in five years because five years ago when we first started hearing about the Oculus Rift, we, uh, you know, people had these grand ideas about, you know, uh, that I don't think really panned out, but at the same time, the experiences that they promised were, you know, pretty, pretty safe. You know, you could sit there and you could watch a 140 inch movie screen all by yourself. You could, you know, kind of uh, interact with people, uh, you know, you know, pretty personally. I think the experiences were pretty spot on, but the price kept it, you know, out of pe most people's hands. So that was five years ago. We, uh, you know, kind of got what we promised. Where do you see in five years? Do you see it evolving? Is it just more people have access to the technology? Where's VR in five years? Yeah, I think I, I think to answer that, I think really, you know, we had talked, you know, throughout this uh, kind of dialogue about content, and it, you know, it's going to take that killer app. Um, you know, I think a lot of the times what what I see with new technologies is that it'll be sometimes it'll be kids that have a headset because they want to play games, and you know, and the father will use it to watch sports or some movies, and you know. Then there'll be apps for the mothers to go in there and check out, you know, shopping or how to, you know, the home gardening. So I, I could see that all happening, but where I really see VR is, is, you know, and, and I would love to see this is I would love to really see the, you know, AR is going to have its place. Uh, VR will have its place, but where I think that the, the real magic happens where there's, you know, it's everywhere and it's an everyday thing mm -hmm. um, would really be, you know, people use, you know, mixed reality a lot. And it, I, I think there is a, a there's going to be a convergence of AR and VR at some point, you know, it's, it's, it's really like, you know, when you watch a movie and you're like, how did that director just foreshadow that, you know, in the future, you know, what's happening 20 years. 
I think when you see, you know, Tony Stark's and Iron Man 2 playing with Jarvis and, you know, I feel like a lot of that is, is happening. I mean, you've and got... Da- and, and, and David, I'm going to uh, stop right there. Music means we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Everyone, Mr. David Lee, he is the CSO and COO of, of course, Spatial Land. We'll be right back. More Computer America after this. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. We are about 31 minutes past the hour, and we are going to be wrapping up our conversation here. Uh, but, you know, we have a few more things to talk about with Spatial Land. You can check them out, spatialland.com. We have a link to it in the show notes. And again, joining us is Mr. David Lee. He is the CSO and COO of Spatial Land. And uh, again, I apologize for the break, but um, yeah, you were just getting into, you know, kind of how movies and, you know, movies and television, things like that. I think you're, you know, you can be more dead, you know, uh, dead right because, you know, it, it's funny. Like when, uh, you know, when, when, uh, when we got our phones, our smartphones, our iPhones, one of the first things that we did was we installed a tricorder app and that was in Star Trek and, you know, I, it, it was goofy, nerdy, but someone took the time and it was one of the first apps out there to turn their futuristic device into something that, that looked closer to, what we've seen in television and movies. So you were saying that you think that pop, you know, that, that culture and movies and cinema are going to inspire kind of how VR, you know, kind of works for us in the near future. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I really think it's, you know, I think we had this ethos in the company um, of, of just, you know, great storytellers, you know, award-winning guys that, that, what sometimes when I see what comes out of their minds is just mind boggling. And I think it's pure imagination. I think that, you know, anything is possible with, with, with VR. And, you know, I would love to see, you know, we've already got Alexa coming into our house and, you know, soon to follow Google, and um, so we've already got these personalities speaking to us and we've got, you know, AI and machine learning and, and, and there's so much buzz around that and people do such great things with that, that it's only natural that it goes from voice to something that's visual. And you're going to see that with Magic Leap and all the things that they're coming out with, um, you know, for, for, you know, kind of the manufacturing space and, and for companies. But you know, imagine coming home and, and being in augmented space, but also being able to just immediately enable like a VR experience. Um, that's what I'm excited for. I mean, I think that I would love to come home to that. Um, and I think that there are, there are movies that have predicted things. I um, mean, you, you could look at Matrix and and say that, you know, to be fair, actually, right, to, to, to be fair, right off the bat, uh, the Matrix didn't work out too well for humans. I, just throwing that out there. <laughs> but you, you kind of look at, um, you know, humans having a different persona. You know, yeah. And, and 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 going into these different spaces and enjoy. It's kind of like you know what's, I think it's uh, Second Life, right? It's like what Second Life aimed to do maybe ten years ago. You, you're gonna it's going to be at such a different scale because it's not going to be, you know, a little avatar on a 2d screen, but you're actually in this space and you're, you're running around and you're, 
you can be social and go play sports or you can go shopping. I mean, I, it's, it's scary to think like that, but, you know, I, I've got nephews and nieces who were born with phones and, and, you know, I never touched a phone. You know, I did work for Motorola, so I probably a little bit earlier than most people, but I mean, you know, I think that the, the students, you know, of the future and, and the people that are going to be in, in the job force in the future are, are going to be coming up on VR. And that's going to spur this whole new set of ideas from, from, you know, future generations of what, you know, where they can take VR. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, I, I don't think we're going to see it in the next, you know, five to seven years, but who knows what will happen in, in, in 15 years. Um, but I'm pretty excited. I think every year I'm just seeing leaps and bounds in the technology side, on the content side. You know, there's still a lot of optimization and work to be done. But I think that everybody that's 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 in this space is, is really pushing the envelope, and that's really exciting. I, I you know, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, the technology side. Uh, when it first, you know, when this technology first came out for consumers, I mean, it's been around for a long time for, you know, kind of larger corporations, but for consumers, um, I remember when we first started talking about it, we were like, you know, this is, this is going to cost you 2000 to $2,500 just to run because you have to buy the computer and the headset and, you know, and then, you know, besides that it's whatever nowadays, I mean, I think, uh, we talked to AMD and NVIDIA that, you know, it's, uh, it's going to cost you maybe eleven twelve hundred dollars and that's you know half the price in just a matter of like three or four years so you're right you know if we take that to 10 years it's going to be accessible in schools and in job sites and in consumer recreational use it's it the technology is going to be there and you're right the content has to be there to follow up and it sounds like you guys kind of have that part covered so with that being said, I mean, if people want to find out more about Spatial Land and what it is you guys are doing, or maybe even, oh, and by the way, uh, are your tools available for uh, individuals, companies, people to use? Uh, right now, our tool set is on um, uh, an enterprise versions only. So we get mm -hmm. to just work with companies and select companies right now. And, and that's more for us to just keep on fine tuning the product. And, but it's not available for commercial anybody to download just yet, but you can always contact us and, and we're more than happy to help and we're here to help and answer any questions about the technology. Perfect. And again, that's Spatial Land. We have a link to it in the show notes. And David, thank you for joining uh, for joining us here to talk about this. VR, it's, um, it, it's, I hate to say that it keeps, you know, it's almost here, but at this point, you know, if you really want it, you can go get it. And it sounds like you guys are doing a lot of great work. So, um, and, and I know you can't talk about the companies that you're working with, um, but you're saying that, you know, just kind of uh, in general, industries and large companies are definitely going to start creating content. You know, it's not just going to be weird indie games and, uh, you know, just kind of weird applications. Like, you know, businesses are really starting to take a shine to this. Yes. And uh, while I can't name one company I can... We've worked with uh, Reebok so far, um, AMD. We are working on a big educational experience with Oculus. Mm -hmm. um, and we are um, demoing a, uh, a music experience for Lincoln Park that was done with Intel um, tomorrow um, at ComplexCon. And I believe the kind of tentative launch date for the Lincoln Park experience will be end of month. Very, very cool. So, yeah, and, and we'll definitely keep an eye on that. And if you and if you like later on, if you want to send us a link to that, we'll be happy to publish it on our site as well. But uh, but in the meantime, David, once again, thank you so much, and uh, have a great day. It, this was a lot of fun to uh, talk about. Looking forward to having you guys back on in a year to you know see where you landed. Thank you very much, Craig. Thank you. All right, bye bye. All right, everyone, and there he goes. So there you have it, Spatial Land. If you want to check out more, be sure to check out the show notes now. Before we go ahead and move on to computer and technology news, uh, I have to, I definitely want to get one thing uh, not out of the way per se, but um, but yeah, you know, I, I definitely want to uh, read something from one of our sponsors because hey, we love our sponsors here at Computer America, and yeah, definitely want to get you know get to this. So uh, here we go, and of course, if you're hiring, that's right, you know them, you've heard them on the show before, ZipRecruiter. 
That's right. And if you, you know, and if you want to know what it's like if hiring could be easier, if it was more streamlined and less time consuming, well, even when you're busy, you could still be smart about the way you hire. And you know what? Hey, that's where ZipRecruiter steps in. And with ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards with just a single click. So you can rest easy knowing that your job has been seen by the right candidates. And then ZipRecruiter puts its smart matching technology to work, actively notifying qualified candidates about your job within minutes of posting. So you can receive the best matches. Obviously, notifications push directly to, hey, the people you want to hire. And that's why ZipRecruiter is different, where unlike other hiring sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on the right candidates finding you. It finds them. Because let's face it, you know, if there's a lot of different postings, your posting could be, well, kind of glossed over by the person you are best looking for. And you can even get a head start with the interview process. You can have screening questions. You can make sure that only people with the right experiences actually sign up and, you know, offer their services because, hey, you don't want to, you, you don't want to waste time. Hiring should not be uh, busy work. Hiring should be quick, easy, and efficient. So it's no wonder why 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just a single day. Check that out. And the easy to use ZipRecruiter dashboard lets you manage all the hiring process right through their website. Couldn't be easier. So ZipRecruiter, right? It's the smartest way to hire. And find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by growing businesses of all sizes and industries to help find the right qualified candidate for the job. And here's where Computer America comes in. Here's where our audience comes in. And ZipRecruiter.com forward slash computer. Remember that? Computer. ComputerAmerica.com forward slash computer. And that will be the best way for you to post your job. And hey, for Computer America listeners, absolutely free. One more time, ZipRecruiter.com forward slash computer. And again, we want to thank ZipRecruiter for, of course, sponsoring Computer America. All right. So with, uh, with that being said, why don't we go ahead and move on to computer and technology news? Because, hey, we have a lot to talk about. And yeah, again, none of it Blizzard related, unfortunately. Well, actually, maybe one Blizzard related story. You know, it, I think it's stuck in there. But uh, in general, hey, it's going to be great computer technology news. So here we go. Brought to you by Fire Dragon Security. So if you have been living under a rock, this is going to come as a, as a shock to you. Uh, the iPhone 8 was just released a couple of weeks ago. It's uh, doing very, very well. All of Apple is actually selling products very, very well. It's a great turnaround for the company because, hey, you know, their sales have been up and down, up and down. And, hey, good to see them up again. But the iPhone 8 just came out. So what does Apple do? They say, hey, why don't we go ahead and make the, I the iPhone 10? And, hey, just got released and the reviews are in. And one review that we like to cover here on the program is, uh, yeah, and, and, and one review that we like to kind of do on the show here is the fact that fixing a phone, because I'm a huge proponent of being able to fix your own devices, it saves you a lot of money, it you know kind of makes it more yours, and hey, let's face it, it's uh, you know just easier to have it in your hands, order a part online, and just do it yourself. Well, I fix it to some of the best repair videos on the internet, and they always give their rating on how easy or difficult something may be to fix. And here we have it. They have their iPhone 10 teardown, finds two battery cells, and an unprecedented logic board. So, like you said, there's some impressive engineering, but uh, yeah, there you have it. It's, it, you know, this is, this is pretty cool because, you know, other reviews are going to tell you that it's cool, it's stylish, it fits in your pocket, uh, it's not too heavy, not too light, um, it's fast, blah, blah, blah. But the iFixit reviews, we definitely like those because it gets into the hardware and what you're actually buying. So, with that being said, this article is from Ars Technica, and of course, it's covering iFixit's uh, work. But they said that, um, 
Yeah, they said that they tore down the iPhone 10 and what they found, hey, were a few surprises. And they said that the phone had been overhauled on the inside nearly as much as on the outside. And with most and the most immediate uh, I'm sorry, the most immediately noticeable quirk is how Apple has laid out the iPhone 10's batteries and how and I'm sorry, which continue to dominate how the rest of the internals are constructed. And namely, the company has planted two cells into the device. Which is a first, I'm sorry, uh, there we go, which is the first for any phone and, well, at least any iPhone in any L, I'm sorry, in an L shaped configuration. So, as iFixit notes, Apple seems to have doubled up in order to be flexible with how it could allocate space for the rest of the device's components, not to explicitly beef up the iPhone X's overall battery power. So the battery compa- the battery capacity here is 2,760 milliamp, which is a bit less than most batteries out there, which are about 3,500 to 4,000. Which, uh, which by the way, as a point, which is slightly smaller than the 2,691 milliamp in the iPhone 8 Plus. So it's even a little more powerful and dense than a larger battery in the iPhone 8. Still, the the 10's 5.8 inch display appears to have taken its toll on the overall battery life. With the iPhone 10 review found that the device fell well short of the 8 Plus in terms of longevity, albeit it's still a de- it's still decent on the whole. So even though it has a slightly larger battery, it still runs dead quicker, and that is again due to the screen. And the screen is much much better. So, also worth noting is how Apple has shrunk the iPhone X's logic board. And here's the part that I found very interesting. Where, according to iFix's teardown, they were able to essentially fold or found a way to fold the logic board motherboard in half. And it's the board that you plug in all the other components to, teaches them or tells them how to communicate with, with one another. And they essentially fold it in half to kind of two stack it. So that it was taking up, they said that the component was taking up roughly 35% more space than the iPhone 8 Plus's logic board area when fully laid out onto something that is 70% the size of that board on the whole. So the board is 70% smaller in terms of actual physical space within the iPhone 10. But if you laid it out, if you unstacked them and laid them side by side, they were 35 or about a third larger than the iPhone 8 Plus's logic board. It's a very interesting way to design your phone. Makes, and of course, uh, as the article continues, saying that the, mini- the miniaturization is unprecedented, but notes that because of this, because of the way that the logic board is folded over, makes it harder to repair. And the fact that if you need to repair certain parts of the phone, you might need to disassemble even more parts just to get to those parts to begin with. Because, hey, that's that's a hallmark of iPhone. They're not the easiest to repair. And if you wanted to, you're probably gonna be disassembling half the phone just to do something simple. But I was surprised by this. I fix it on the whole, gave it a six out of 10 in repairability. They also quoted that there are less screws that you can actually mess with, and there's a lot more glue. The problem with the glue isn't so much that it's glue, but more the fact that it's a cost-saving measure, and if you were to take something apart, then the glue, you know, it doesn't stick as well the second time around, and it saves space, but opening and closing your phone to repair it multiple times is going to start taking its toll. But... On the whole, the iPhone 10, actually a very surprising uh, repairability score. I thought it'd be a lot worse, but there you have it. Six out of 10, iPhone 10, with a couple of components that are, again, surprise, surprising the way that Apple was able to design the internals of this thing. Very, very well engineered. So there you have it, the iPhone 10, super cool. Now, this next story. It's one of the flagships of today's episode, and you can find it in the show notes labeled under cockatoos, 
Ravage, Australia. Here's a problem I never thought I'd read about, but here we are nonetheless. Again, our second guy, Mr. Sean Gallagher, and Australia's national broadband networks are under relentless attack by cockatoos. Yes, the bird with the yellow frills and the thing. Yep. So with that being said, Australia's national broadband network, the effort to bring high-speed internet to the masses down under, has encountered many speed bumps. And the plan to bring fiber optic broadband internet to every Australian has been paired paired back in its ambitions with a shift to a fiber backbone between nodes and a distribution over copper wire or cable networks to the majority of users. I've definitely heard about that. We have not been covering the national broadband network in Australia here on the program, but safe to say they keep running out of money and it is incredibly expensive. So yeah, they're hitting a lot of speed bumps. But they said that the cost saving move, which put ISPs and cable providers in charge of managing uh, customers access has caused some uh, consternation. But now the operators of the National Broadband Network have discovered another problem that affects the cost of delivering the backbone. And, well, the author says it's for the birds. So, check this out. They said that the BBC reports that the National Broadband Network technicians have discovered cockatoos have been damaging the ends of spare fiber cables left in place on communication towers for future work. Yeesh. They said that, uh, yeah, they said that uh, they chew on them with their beaks, they chew, wearing through the steel braiding that protect the fibers. And according, and active cables haven't been affected, thank goodness. So they have been no less, uh, there has been no loss of service as of yet due to cockatoo attacks. The end of cables carrying active traffic are, of course, protected by plastic cages. You know, it, yeah, obviously. But the cables left with their ends exposed have become a favorite for the birds who use them to help wear down their ever-growing beaks. And the cable costs, uh, and the cables cost about 10,000 Australian bucks or dollar reduce versus about uh, $7,700 US to replace. So for every cable that these birds are using as teething tools, cost about seven or about eight thousand dollars that's no good and he said that's australia for you if the spiders and snakes don't get you the cockatoos will and worldwide animal incidents are are responsible for an epic amount of damage to critical infrastructure as anyone who follows cyber squirrel one twitter feed knows saying that in august alone there were 51 service outages caused by animal incidents across 23 u.s states and eight other countries 20 by squirrels, 16 by birds, 3 by rats, 2 by snake, 2 by raccoon, and 1 each by a cat and a bobcat. Quite a diverse lineup there. And they said that uh, and they said that critters pose a vastly larger threat to the world's critical infrastructure than cyber attacks, of which there have been only a handful officially confirmed or suspected cases and what they're mean by cyber attacks they mean by cyber attacks that actually bring down physical infrastructure i recall a uh, a particle accelerator that was taken down because of like a vol mole type situation hey the furry critters if we put something down can't really blame them for wanting to find food shelter or other tools to help them get by it's just what they're gonna do but yeah, cockatoos ravaging Australia, or at least the, the spare cables that are putting up the, uh, you know, for putting up the services, the internet services. I just thought that was so weird that we could not not cover it. All right, actually, you know, before we go ahead and do, uh, and before we do our next story, I do indeed want to check out our winner because hey, as I mentioned. We, of course, give out a prize every single Friday to a lucky winner to win a prize from Logitech. I believe we're still giving away the Logitech the Logitech M720 Triathlon Mouse. That's what we're doing. So this week's winner is, drawing it right now, this week's winner is 
There we go. Mr. Aaron Lewis. Aaron, if you're listening to Computer America, thank you so much. Listens to us in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky. And all he had to do was follow Computer America on Twitter. And Aaron Lewis, thank you so much. And hey, thanks for listening to the show. We'll contact you after the show, get your prize out to you. And of course, Logitech will handle the rest. They're very great about that. And hey, if you want to be the next Aaron Lewis, be sure to tune in next Friday. And hey, you have to enter the contest. You, you can't win if you don't play. So now, 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 let's see, let's see, let's see. We have a couple of stories. Hmm. All right. Why don't we do this one? So this is one that, you know, hey, it was announced early, so it snuck into our news feed, and we're definitely going to cover it. But BlizzCon, for those of you who don't know, it's a huge convention dedicated to Blizzard, who makes a number of IPs, be it Diablo, StarCraft, uh, Warcraft, Overwatch. I mean, they have a great lineup of things, and, and BlizzCon is kind of their way to hype up their fan base, uh, announce new things, and new moves. Well, one of the things that they were attempting, or, or one of the things that they did, or they announced already, and this is going to be a cool thing for anyone out there who enjoys StarCraft. Well, StarCraft 2 is going to be free to play on November 14th and beyond. And this coming to us from The Verge, Chame Gartenberg. And yeah, starting November 14th, Blizzard announced during its annual BlizzCon conference, saying that the new free version, that's right, the new free version of the game will offer access to Wings of Liberty, which was the original Terran uh, campaign. Yep, so uh, we'll offer the original Terran campaign, Wings of Liberty, along with every co-op commander up through level 5. And Blizzard is also making the game online-ranked competitive multiplayer available for free with access to units from all three StarCraft 2 releases. That, of course, uh, and they said that although players will have to unlock that mode first by achieving 10 first wins of the day in unranked games or against the computer, something Blizzard says is going to preserve the quality and integrity of the ranked experience. Essentially, they don't want people going in completely blind. They want to at least, you know, make people prove that you've played a couple of times. I think it's much better than a leveling experience such as League of Legends, but yeah, that's right. StarCraft 2 going free to play and you get essentially the first expansion for absolute free. And if you have the second expansion, Heart of the Swarm, it was the the, uh, the Zerg one. You get that for free if you already happen to have the first StarCraft 2. So this is going to be a great boon to StarCraft because their competitive scene is still, you know, one of, you know, one of the most popular, but getting people to sit, you know, to sit down and play StarCraft 2, that's been a little bit harder for the casual player. But if you can offer it free to play, I mean, hey, you can't really hate on StarCraft or anyone giving you a free game. And honestly, one of the best real-time strategies out there on the market. So definitely pay attention to that. And there's going to be a lot more news and a lot more similar news coming out of BlizzCon here in the next couple of days. BlizzCon happens throughout this weekend. And I know they've already announced things like new heroes for Overwatch. They've already announced a new expansion for World of Warcraft. They announced classic servers for World of Warcraft. You know, being able to go back 10, 13 years to the original, to the original experiences. Yeah, Blizzard's going all out this BlizzCon. So in the meantime, everyone, thank you for tuning in. I'm sure you hear the music in the background, and that means we are just flat out of time. Once again, I want to thank Aaron Lewis for signing up and, of course, winning this week's contest sponsored by Logitech. And, of course, we'll be, we'll be sure to contact him later. I also want to thank our guest for today. Spatial Land for explaining to us what they do with VR and where VR and where VR is going to be going here in the next couple of years. But folks, that's just it. We have no more time. The week is over. And my goodness, that went by fast. I hope all of you are switching gears from Halloween to Thanksgiving, starting to get all of your plans and everything ready. Not putting Christmas lights up too soon. Don't be that person. Or do. I don't care. So with that being said, be sure to tune in next week. We have a great lineup of guests, including 
we have an interview with uh yep with uh with Chevrolet that we are definitely going to be airing later on in the pro you know later on in the week and also just a heads up for everyone out there Veterans Day is Friday November 10th Computer America will not have a live show during that event so with that being said everyone have a great day thank you so much and uh yeah catch you later bye bye everyone